aspects of the topic kind of interacted with each other that we did not uh, plan about. So the idea for the discussion is I have, I have a kind of questionnaire that I would love if it would develop, develop kind of organically. I would also like to um, involve the audience um, if they, they like to. So, um, so I, I can of course start with, with some thoughts or some questions I'm interested in, but you're, you're very welcome to take over and also bounce questions back to me. Maybe kind of I try could also try to represent the group of authors which kind of uh, contributed to this discussion before in the in the in the magazine. One question I would like to open with is um, when will you address the question of uh, performance and when, when we kind of started thinking about queer architecture, I, I very quickly dropped this um, topic at the beginning. We were coming across these two um, uh, strategies of camp and referentiality. So this was kind of um, dealt with as the, the core of, of queer architecture, at least gay architecture, because it was also kind of focused firstly on, on male architects. So, this, and you kind of had a negative um, attitude to it, kind of asking what is the reference for, what is the irritation for if it does not perform, and you kind of push it away, saying the firm, I'm, I'm not interested in it because the reference itself has not only the irritation also not the risk of performing. So we have to talk about this, this idea uh, of, of architecture as something triggering performance or kind of, um, yeah, kind of being a stage for, for things, uh, and maybe you can uh, kind of take the ball about this. Uh, I, actually, I'm not sure uh, if you have misunderstood me and asked her, being uh, not very precise, but actually, performance is a very important part uh, of, of, of doing aspects, yeah, in the clear sense. We yeah, are uh, referring to Harry uh, and uh, South Africa as well. Uh, I mean, performing is describing uh, the core, uh, creating a corporate sense with, with the things which, which, which are uh, among you, uh, but also uh, interacting uh, with, with, with entities. Uh, therefore, no performance is, is definitely a, a very important part, but also a strategy of survival within uh, clearing uh, practices. Therefore, uh, uh, no to no performance, yes to performance, uh, as, 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 uh, as a very important way of, of, of practicing architecture. No, no, performance is very important. Yeah, the yeah. bodily inscription of... Most important aspect, actually. If it's about creating architecture, you put the performance on the, the forefront, and um, the reference and the irritation kind of maybe as a starting point, because once you, you use the irritation, you start to question the norms, and then you start to ask yourself how can you trigger different performances, right? Mm -hmm. yeah, I understood it this way. Yeah, indeed. I think the only thing that I can speak to is in this early discussion on camp that you mentioned it was like interestingly in the work of this art group and then also the falling out between the artists around Lady de Maras and general ideas as an art group, general ideas those of you who know their work, they work very heavily with, the, with this camp uh, aesthetic. Um, particularly in their sort of early kind of performance based work, um, which was called Miss General Idea. It's basically the idea of a pattern. Yeah, it's a sort of beauty cuisine kind of event, and it's um, Miss General Idea is sort of a fictional character that is sort of performed and performed again and again, and sort of pointed precisely to how these kind of culturally, cultural signification systems that in a way sort of create meaning, that create the sort of stability of meaning, you know, that um, uphold the straight line between the binary uh, gender order and so on, that in a way through these performative acts, you can begin to kind of destabilize that. You can begin to destabilize meaning. That's also what um, people like Judith Butler talk about, um, about when they speak about sort of the performance and performativity of gender um, as a kind of system, um, you know, as something that is almost like an act um, on, a, on a stage that is preset to some extent, that is predefined. Um, but what I find interesting, so for instance, Maras, this group, they really rejected that. They dealt much more with uh, 
uh, question of, kind of language and how language operates. But they were also very much interested in performance as in the performance of space, the performance of architecture, and how the architectural space, both in its kind of material, but also in its kind of larger immaterial social dimension, performs to bring about these sort of networks of people, um, can bring about sort of collective um, identities and create collective bodies where there is a process that is in a sort of constant unfolding in a way, a kind of constant becoming. So they were much, much more interested, you know, less in these kind of, yeah, undoing of these kind of signification practices, but really in sort of how can we create ecosystems? <laughs> That's also why I'm interested in this kind of term of ecologies, you know, how can we create the ecosystems in which people, things, practices can coexist and flourish. Um, and I think that's sort of what I find interesting about this work, but perhaps that's also why somebody like Maras has been overlooked by architectural history in a way, because his work is in that sense not very architectural, um, or um, I don't know, wouldn't be considered in this kind of um, mainstream view of what uh, constitutes a sort of worthy architectural practice. It would sort of fall under the radar a little bit. Yeah, what would actually happen with, with the camp and the, also the, the drag, but there's also something you can call drag architecture, is this movement, it's like a different or re appreciation of the decoration. And that would also kind of uh, address this question of the skepticism of modernity towards decoration for, for several reasons. And now there is this group, at least we're talking about. Maybe of the 70s, early 80s, they embraced this decoration. First, you can then kind of judge it as totally senseless collection of emotional objects, but, but it then turns into something different. And I think we have uh, also an interest in kind of question or addressing these, these, these questions of decoration within architecture. Again, I would be interested in your point of view. And, and do you see these? These, these strategies or the way to, to reintroduce is related or is it something, something different? Yeah, yeah I, think, I think there's much to say about this. I mean, first of all, to come back to the performances and I think I don't answer directly, but, but I think there's much to say that has not been uh, analyzed about the tools of the architect because as much as, you know, in art we would find many kinds of performance acts that would lead to global visions of the world or to utopias, uh, this is something that does not basically does not exist in the mainstream architects. Well, architects actually have not changed much. I think that you know, almost since the 19th century, okay, they have changed their uh, boards by computers, but in terms of what they do with the tools, it's pretty much the same. Which is this bird eye view of uh, I, I would even you know of, of what is to be planned, uh, and, and and I would even dare to say that uh, you know usually architects uh, start designing by the exterior alone. So it's considering this idea of the erection. No, probably, almost no architects start by the interior uh, where people actually live. Um, so I think I, I also, uh, I was very intrigued by the latest uh, Richard Sennett book uh, talking about urbanism and saying, you know, maybe actually so sociology as, you know, as uh, a travail de terrain, you know, it could also be interesting, which is also a performative background. You know, once you go there and you start collecting data, your data yourself, uh, uh, it is also maybe a tool that has not been considered in architecture. But to come back to this decoration, actually, uh, it was, uh, it's funny that uh, when I started reading the, the Green Insects from Gretzky, uh, you know, I was reading the thank yous in the beginning, mm -hmm. and he thanks his, I don't know, his dean or something, because he actually started teaching me interior design school. Mm -hmm. I don't remember now. And, um, I don't want to compare myself to Gretzky, but uh, it was actually when I started teaching at the head in the interior design department that I started uh, questioning myself about this idea of decoration that has completely disappeared or been neglected by uh, this male architecture attitude that still today, I mean, and as much as we would like it to be otherwise, still is we uh, still in most of the critics that he assists to decorative is synonymous of superfluous, bad, not necessary. 
So uh, if you want to criticize the project, you need to say that it's the correct thing. So, so it's still there. And, uh, and, and I had this uh, utopian idea of actually rewriting uh, because actually the interesting thing about interior design is that it, is that it's, it, it actually does not have a, a real history of theory. It's kind of like a patchwork of many things, which is very interesting, uh, but it doesn't have a proper, uh, you know, uh, scholar background uh, and history. Whereas, uh, as I learned in high school, you know, the beginning of modernism with, with all these guys, William Morris, and you know, William Morris ended up like being uh, working. Uh, you know, as, as kind of like a socialist act. Um, so very linked to a political, I mean, not very linked, completely linked to a political act. So I was, uh, and, and then, you know, it's maybe the, the change of operates in the second Bauhaus with, uh, uh, of course, Gropius was already there, but, uh, you know, when, when Hannes Meyer takes over and, you know, he has a very strong political agenda that it would be interesting to analyze as well. I, I, I don't know it so well, but, you know, as, as one of the ones again, uh, political, yes, very important because it was politically social, but still yet very military uh, male agenda to actually accomplish architecture. Even the the first Bauhaus it was still interesting when they did the Somerville House. You know, as a as a manifesto, come on, you know, that was a manifesto of the Bauhaus, you know, Bauhaus, and it was a city. This uh, log house uh, were probably the house itself, as in the red house in Morris, was not so important. But it was important was how we decorated and actually worked up together with the number of you know uh, people working in it. So I think this is something that we have, and of course it's also funny this uh, idea of the primitive hut and the cave, um, because yes, I mean you could restart history by you know by calling the painting as a, as the beginning, I mean the painting and the fire making as the beginning of architectural history, and then of course the decorative coming to play immediately. Um, um, I think this discussion would be very different with artists, you know, how they, they consider the decorative, because they have a, a larger view and a uh, multiplicity of history to also look at the within the voyage than, than ours. Mm. I think it's super interesting, uh, like, throughout the research for, for the Vienna project, we also, of course, research a lot like interior, uh, is like the history of interior architecture, uh, and let's say, like when this shift uh, sort of started, that sort of, uh, material culture sort of it disappears from, from the discipline of architecture completely and goes into lifestyle, you know, magazines. So everything that has to do with um, interior material culture, um, which obviously has a lot of meaning, um, yeah, this is like just everything that you mentioned, like the, uh, like modernism, um, uh, but even before, like uh, uh, before the, uh, the 20th century, um, the, the, like interior was like the materiality of interior was considered as super meaningful, and everything, um, uh, everything, of course, everything was also controlled in a very specific way. But at some point, um, this just left the discipline. Uh, and it became, it, yeah, it's kind of a dematerialization, like it became about the shape of, 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 of the object. Uh, and um, yeah, that's, um, that's why we, we also yeah, wanted to, 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 to go a bit deeper uh, into this kind of interior. When we visited the, the building in Venice afterwards in the, in the, in the office, the editor's office, we were kind of of course, understanding the mechanisms which kind of lead to this normatizations, the economical reasons, uh, the political reasons. Uh, and we were wondering, is there is an alternative? And of course, as external forces are so strong, still we wonder, is there something that can be done from within the discipline of architecture to tackle it, to, to, to attack it, to, to change it? Maybe that's for the three of you who are also practicing architects. Is there a chance to, to, to push something in a different direction against the strong normative powers with the tools of the architects? It's very difficult, of course. I mean, that's a question uh, <laughs> no one can answer really. But I mean, what is certainly something that I think 
is helpful. And what I've seen, like talking to architects um, and, and also looking at a lot of floor plans and then <laughs> the actual apartments, is that a lot of, I mean, now I'm talking about housing, obviously, but uh, could be also described with other technologies, um, is that many, 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 many times the plan um, is the main informer uh, for 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 um, yeah for the design and many times I have the impression that the plan is just extruded um, like for instance just look like looking at the yeah looking at the interior as a three dimensional uh, object uh, um, um, that not only has you know one plane uh, to 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 consider um, is something that already helps but of course it doesn't change um, the system. <laughs> yeah, but the, the, the food chain of decision is uh, contaminated by the same disease. Mm -hmm. Yes, <laughs> of course. Because uh, my, my answer as a practitioner, uh, it would be no. Mm -hmm. I mean, you cannot fight against regulations unless you work for people who decide to live otherwise, otherwise, you know, outside of, the, of these regulations. And that's where we're talking again about the norm and the margins. Mm -hmm. So actually the only way to not live in a nine square meter room is actually to be a marginal and uh, create something else would be illegal. So that's, that's the whole problem is the whole chain of decisions uh, and they, they go up to political issues and, and, and you know, they, they actually, I don't want to say plant the plants because it would be a too nice word for them, but you know, they, 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 they freeze the plants with criteria that you were speaking about how a family has to be, you know, because they are imposing you how to live <laughs> with those plants. Mm -hmm. uh, if you have six kids, also it's a problem. Uh, if, yeah. if you have no kids, or if you are a uh, three, uh, you know, household, whatever, you know, it's, the normal spread here is two and two. Uh, so it's very difficult. I mean, I mean I'm in Switzerland, we have a good uh, cooperative that, that do a bit of work on that, but it's still very uh, shy. I mean, it's been drawing here, this, this, um, this drawing with the frame, um, talking about what's the norm and who's inside and, and who's outside. And it seems so far, like especially in Western society, the, the group outside wasn't so big, so many thought it, it doesn't matter, we can kind of get along with it. But also, also as I already addressed in my introduction, now it seems we're facing like threats which kind of question if we can kind of just accept this setting as it as i mentioned climate change and as i mentioned migration so now there seem to be forces uh, at work which make it impossible to ignore uh, these kind of inside outside this binary relationship and Something we were wondering when we were discussing about the editor's office. Now, addressing climate change, addressing migration, can the idea of, of queering not only architecture, but the, the idea of queering society maybe help to readjust or kind of be a jumping board to address these questions, which seem now way bigger as, as the one do we have full acceptance of LGBTQ? People, which is of course, I think, for me from a personal standpoint, but, but at these larger questions at stake, can that give us some hint how to deal with it? I'm not sure if, uh, uh, if, if clearing these kind of problems might help us solve them, when at least expose them. And I think what I would like to add, and I mentioned uh, in, my, uh, in my presentation, is the very fact that. Will we talk about this in and outside uh, references and this uh, margin, especially, right? Uh, you are addressing these margins. I think what is very important you can be a, a marginalized person or uh, living or being situated in a marginalized uh, position, but actually, uh, it is much about the position. You, you can be clear, right? You can be clear in a, in, a, in a very dominant position, right? So, therefore, I think I'm not very sure if. if can be resolved or address this issue because there are a lot of people 
uh, which belongs to certain groups, and yet they are in very powerful positions. Therefore, it, I think it is somehow twisted. Um, and uh, my, my friend in Berkeley, Ramon Gospel, who insists on this very fact, there are a lot of feminist uh, female, obviously, um, uh, living in Western countries, which are in a position of security, right? And there are a lot of male people in the third world not having this very position. I think what we need to address, uh, why our clearness is uh, referring to this very positionality, I think position is very important. And making this position, uh, how do you say, uh, um, transparent, that would be perhaps a strategy. Yeah, I mean, one of the things that I thought was you know, very clear about your presentation and the notion of the frame, in a way, is that the frame itself is something that is installed in order to create the idea or the sort of seeming idea of stability um, of something being in a kind of natural and balanced state of things, which, in a way, <laughs> things never really are, you know, they're always, always in kind of dynamic uh, flux and in a state of sort of constant um, kind of evolution and change. And, but what the frame does is sort of, it, it fixes something temporarily. And I think we're not, we're in this moment right now, we're perhaps, we're becoming much, much more aware and conscious <laughs> um, of the kinds of frames and the sort of seeming, you know, naturalness let's say, our sort of capitalist way, mode of production and the way of living and so on. And that this, in a way, you know, we're at this point now, I think, where there's a great deal of anxiety in, around sort of questioning patriarchy, questioning sort of orders um, that put people into racialized categories and sort of uphold the sort of stability of like a supposedly natural hierarchy Etc. Etc. You know, and all of these things are at this moment. I think at this point where they expose their artificiality and their fragility. And I think that's a really positive thing. But at the same time, I think we can also see very much the sort of backlash and this kind of desperate holding on um, to these frames. You know, at every turn. I mean, I think the current also kind of expose that very strongly, you know, this kind of weighing up of, I don't know, economic, on, on one level, I think, you know, certain things were thinkable and doable that in 30 years haven't been done, you know, all the planes suddenly stopped and so on and were grounded for months. Um, and at the same time, it, it's this kind of weighing up, right, of do we risk um, our sort of wealth and the way it is being produced. Um, yeah, and as well, it, it really should be questioned by, yeah. Although the, the, this very frame is flexible and has a certain, you know, uh, philosophy or so, mm -hmm. it, yet it rests up to a certain point, this is my very pessimistic view, quite strong. And if, you, if you're coming now back to this very clear question, I mean, you see also a tendency within queer community reproducing this heteronormativity, right? Uh, by and, uh, Sarah Ahmed in Queer Phenomenology has a very nice uh, section where she emphasized that, saying that, uh, you know, actually, this is very question of who is the man and who is the woman, right? Um, and we are, you know, this very sameness, I mean, it is very heavily ingrained and shifting this, this framing. It's very, very, very tricky. And Ramon Grosso, who, uh, I mean, I mean, I, I was putting it up very placative, you know, white, male, uh, 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 patriarchy, etc., etc. But you have really gone through it. Uh, idea of history. You really try to understand how these norms have established, uh, and uh, they haven't established them enough. Mm -hmm. right? So, and shifting these norms is again uh, another big, uh, uh, yeah, uh, needs a lot of power and um, agency, um, uh, performance uh, again. And perhaps we can go by our small stories, right? Not anymore the big projection. Yeah, but that's through, you know, small stories, right? I, I, I mean, my, my, let's say, revelation or discovery when, when I'm approaching UK queer theory or, or the other buildings considered entirely or, or anatomy was very uh, important for me is, is, is this idea you know, that maybe 
actually the margins are uh, they have to stay marginal and that's okay. You know, because there's a tendency that all of these people on the market say I can market them, but you want to waste them out to people who actually at one point had normal. Uh, and they say we are small stories that connect with each other, then maybe it's just another way of moving up to work around the world or on the side or whatever. And, 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 and then just not be fair. I mean, it's the thing to do. Once again, I think I can attach myself. And I repent as, as a white male born under from what I said to do. You know, but anyway, it's very difficult. And, and we hide there and just for that thing. You know, the difference is probably very difficult to not come to this very polarized difference. But maybe the trick is there. I mean, the trick is not. Trip and, and, and kind of like start always be sort of you know, to distinguish that lines or the storylines that also have to pay attention every time to do that with what so called feminism, but it's very uh, good to think of that in this society. So it, it's, it's extremely difficult, I think, and I'm doing it like that. And I do it for my work, uh, thinking that you know, all these small things can really add up to something in whatever that is. But uh, you know, theoretically, I, I started quite a lot. Just forget myself to the small things. And I think that's also kind of like a lesson of integrity and power of domesticity, or, you know, uh, what we see, you know, how you take care of the just the small things and how you give them to them, uh, even in the theoretical ways. Okay, to your point, um, this sort of robustness of the brains, I mean, I think, again, what's interesting here is like I'm just being reminded of like the work of Ramda Shibi. And the way in which she, so, and this brings me back to this idea of kind of narratives and how narratives are often operating as kind of supporting devices for this, you know, how she talks about um, uh, living also at the moment when sort of in a way sort of biological science um, begins to develop and these taxonomies are being established, it's very much through the lens of sort of cultural norms. At the time, and she sort of makes this evident by the way in which he sort of began to look at species that have an anthropomorphized way as sort of having two genders, you know, plants, animals, and everything was like humans in this kind of binary. And so that, in a way, sort of sets up this narrative you know, that then becomes extremely powerful. And the same is true with, I don't know, these. Uh, Tableaus that we are familiar with in uh, you know, archaeological and anthropological museums and so on, you know, where we see um, the sort of um, family, the Uru family, you know, depicted as the sort of family units, <laughs> as sort of male, female children, you know, almost like representing um, the Uru family, you know, and of course we know that this is like a complete sort of fiction. And yet, we sort of don't seem to be able to recognize um, the various sort of power of stories um, that, that, you know, with countless stories um, could be catalogued. I will open up uh, for questions of the audience if they would like to uh, jump in and ask me some quick comments and comment. Space, 
And I was wondering if you uh, had an idea of what could be for you um, a, a really good example of a, of a queer space or something that could be defined as such that you might have done yourself somehow. Mm -hmm. Like if you have an idea of what such a space would be. Um, yeah, well, I mean, it's a good question <laughs> because uh, I also I also think it, it has a certain uh, danger in uh, just uh, using the term um, a queer space. I think I can relate to queering architecture. Queer architecture, I think, it is a little bit not problematic, but I just ask myself if queer. Uh, I will come to queer space in a minute. If queer architecture exists, then feminine and masculine architecture also exist, which actually, um, in my sense of understanding, suggests that male or men are responsible for male architecture or, or masculine architecture, females um, are responsible for feminine architecture, queer people are responsible for queer architecture, where actually I think it should be um, put into gendered uh, categories, but that's just um, like just one thing because I don't, I also don't really know what queering architecture means or, um, but but queer space I guess to me is just I'm I'm speaking as person like a personal experience as as a as a lesbian um, person in this world <laughs> uh, is I guess. Uh, um, every sphere where I don't feel uncomfortable. I, I also have a, I don't have a definition, but I have like an idea of what for me queer space is today. It's, it's, it's an architecture, it's a space which kind of encourages you to experience otherness. Everything that is different than yourself, everything that makes you realize that there is a bigger world, a more complex world outside uh, the one we might know from these more binary um, narrations we are most of the time confronted with. So whatever helps to, to, to lead me to this otherness and kind of make me experience something new which is outside of my existing knowledge or ethics or moral ideas, whatever, I think is for me a queer space, though it's not connected to sexuality anymore, but but to the other, that, that would be my definition. It's of, of of something which has a quality which I would like to call queer space. Mm -hmm. Just perhaps to add, uh, this very question actually at the end of the day uh, is a very uh, put it uh, put it out very in a, in a, in a very prominent way is a Western question. It's very interesting because it's very phenomenal of being queer. Now, from a sexual uh, point of view, but also beyond that, is something which has been introduced via Christianity. This is sort of a very interesting concept, but this will be not, uh, a matter of uh, you know, scope for, for today's discussion. But actually, queerness was everyday practice in a lot of African and African Asian cultures. And they have been exposed to very different setups. Simultaneously, and it was not banned as something, it has not been narrowed or, or streamlined. So there were a lot of different options uh, thinking of you know, uh, potentiality. Um, and I just can add to what you just have said that this could be this very queer spheres, uh, space. And uh, again, uh, perhaps also it is this very question or this very phenomenon we're discussing here has also been to be read within the history of ideas, right? And, and this, and this very question. Uh, has been introduced and established through our Western uh, framework. So, just that. I mean, I, yeah, I already like when we talk about her, I made a lot of women, <laughs> but in this text that you also mentioned, orientation toward the queer phenomenology, I think she speaks about a sort of slanted line, and I think you also mentioned this idea of a space that doesn't allow people to sort of disappear into the background or to be, to assume a neutral position. Um, so something that in a way kind of activates you, that to some extent also causes a sense of discomfort, but perhaps for people who aren't already sort of on the straight line, can also provide a sense of comfort or a sort of 
make you realize that your body in its sort of otherness um, sort of fits into that space better than into that um, space that in a way sort of demands this kind of neutrality. Well, I also did me that it's come yeah. as uh, a feeling that is not good yeah. and that, and, yeah. but of course, yeah, that's just yeah. to clarify the yeah. yeah. I, I would have said um, this, this improvising attitude might be the wrong answer, but yeah. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I would have said that uh, probably spaces where we are confronted to other living beings mm -hmm. uh, is consciousness. So let's say what we usually call nature. Uh, in many forms, uh, you know, when you get hit by an insect, you, um, or things like that, and you're exposed in, uh, in a relationship with other living beings that you're in control at all. I mean, it's a very reductive, of course, uh, um, definition of nature, if nature still exists, but, um, you know, I would have think, I would have thought that the first one, I mean, of course, there are the traditional historical hubs and all those spaces, but uh, in my opinion, if you consider all living beings as being part of uh, 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 contribution to space, then, then there are many things that we don't control and we are exposed to in those natural spaces. Mm -hmm. I'm very happy that you led the discussion there and would like to close it there. This interest in the question, how do we interact or how do we design a built environment in relation to the other species, species? It's actually something we want to wanna have a deeper look next year. So it's the June issue next year. It has a working title called Coexistence, and we're also very much interested in this discourse that our Hellway has established. So I see that you're interested in it, and I'm really happy to realize it because we're also kind of chewing and thinking about these kind of things. And this is maybe kind of leads to a preview of what, what we will be working on, and maybe one or several of you will join in this discussion at some point later. I want to thank you very much and ask the audience for another applause for your great lectures and this great discussion. Thank you very much for, for being here today.